It is now 7.06, and I'm reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, November 15, 2021. Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Jane. Here. Mr. Krubis. Here. Mr. Rising. Here. Ms. Deming. Present. Ms. Grover. Present. Ms. Donahue. Here. Ms. Fosdick. Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Jane, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next Board of Education meeting will be held on Monday, December 6th. And we have uh, a couple of board salutes today. So, um, Mr. Karubis. The board salutes steps for being selected as the 2021 Best of Naperville Award recipient in the category of schools. Each year, the Naperville Award Program identifies exceptional organizations that help make the Naperville area a great place to live, play, and work. Recognition is given to those organizations that have shown the ability to use their best practices and implemented programs to generate competitive advantages and long-term value. Congratulations to Principal Kimberly M Maloney and her staff on this well-deserved recognition. Thank you. Ms. Fosdick. The board salutes McCarty Elementary kindergarten teacher, Kim Lejeski for her recent heroic efforts. Kim came across a serious accident and without hesitation stepped in to help. She assisted in getting two small children out of the vehicle and led them to safety at a nearby restaurant. We salute Kim Lejeski for her acts of kindness and courage. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rising. The board proudly salutes the Matia Valley High School girls volleyball team who won the state championship this past weekend. This is the Mustangs first volleyball championship and the first state championship for any sport in the school's history. The team reached the super sectional by defeating Plainfield North at the Oswego East sectional and the Mustangs triumphed over juggernaut Mother Macaulay <laughs> uh, by, uh, in three sets, 15-25, 25-18, and 25-17 by winning their 24th consecutive match. I think their final record was like 40-2. and two. Um, Congratulations to the coaches and the team on this great achievement. Our next item is our student representative report by Lisa Natucci from Niqua um, Valley High School. <laughs> Fan club. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Just one second. <clears throat> okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Natochi. I'm Niqua Valley's school board representative, and it is my pleasure to represent Niqua for you all here tonight. It's been a busy few weeks for Niqua athletics. The varsity football team saw an end to their season in the quarterfinals after a hard fought game. The boys cross country team took 10th in state where they've been top 10 for 17 out of the last 20 years. The girls cross country team, girls swimming, and the boys and girls basketball teams all had a strong end to their seasons. As this one ends, however, Wildcats are starting to train for gymnastics, wrestling, bowling, and other winter sports. We can't wait to see what new heights you'll reach this season. 12 Niqua seniors signed national letters of intent on November 10th, demonstrating their dedication to continue playing their sport at the collegiate level. Congratulations on all of your hard work paying off. We also got to see the beginning of the math, chess, and speech team seasons, and they've already accomplished so much. The speech team alone has taken home nearly 50 individual awards over the last two weeks. Keep going, Wildcats. We are so excited to see your achievements over the rest of the season. 
In order to celebrate all of the NEQA accomplishments in the last year, we will host the Red Carpet Rally on November 19th, where students will be honored for academic and athletic excellence over the last year. We are so excited to show off our Wildcat pride. On November 3rd, many parent organizations such as the PTSA, Athletic Booster Club, PATHS Program, NEQA Music, and the Theater Parents Association banded together to volunteer, raise money, and spread information about all of the various ways they support the NEQA community during an event called All In For Students. We couldn't thrive without all of this aid, and we thank every parent that's involved in these activities. The NEQA Theater Program showed off the culmination of all of their hard work in the fall play, titled Play On. It ran from November 11th to the 13th, and this hilarious comedy received rave reviews. We are all so excited to support the theater program and their next endeavors. Last month, the class of 2023 hosted a book drive, meeting their goal of collecting 500 books from NEQA students and families. It is so inspiring to see Wildcats working hard to make an impact on their community. Members of the NEQA community are joining together to create the Student Equity Action Committee in order to hear the range of perspectives that District 204 has to offer. There are so many diverse voices all around us, and it's clear that we will all fight for everyone's views to be heard. Tomorrow marks the start of the Student Council's annual Holiday 204 Drive to provide families in our district with the money they need to make it through this holiday season. It's always awesome to see everyone working together during these cold winter months to spread joy in our community. Teachers and parents alike are preparing for parent-teacher conferences, which will be held on the 18th of November. Both groups are working hard to make sure that our students are as successful as possible, and we thank everyone involved for their dedication. On December 2nd and 3rd, NEQA's 25th annual Crystal Concerts will be held. Our award-winning music program has been practicing for months to bring us this beautiful performance. It is so wonderful to be back on stage, and we can't wait to appreciate it. In only one short month, final exams will be upon us. Although it's been a while since we experienced in-person exams, administration and students alike are putting an effort to make this as smooth of a transition as possible. Keep working hard, Wildcats, and we know you'll succeed. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the epidemic of suicide and deteriorating mental health that such a competitive school fosters. We need to do better as a community by supporting our peers and cultivating an environment that encourages being open and prioritizing oneself. There are so many young lives that have been cut short because instead of fostering a supportive place to learn and grow, Nequa Valley and other District 204 schools have become a crucible that pits us against each other. I too have struggled with my mental health. Last month, I began to take SSRIs to cope with depression and anxiety, and I am one of dozens in just my graduating class. We need to do better. Check in on your friends, your students, and your children. It doesn't have to be this way. It's been a pleasure speaking to you all tonight. Thank you for listening. Have a great night, and as always, go Wildcats. Thank you. It is now time for public comment. 60 minutes is allowed for public comment, and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups, and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep your comments age appropriate. Public comments represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. So tonight we have 21 people signed up. So if everyone can kind of shorten their talks a little bit, we can fit all 21 people in. And we will be cutting people off when they hit the three minute uh, mark. So um, I'm gonna call the first speaker and then I'll call who's going to follow. So that might help speed up people coming to the microphone. So the first speaker is Christopher Bond, followed by Jeff Lindquist. And thank you all for coming. I know it was a cold night, so thank you. Good evening, my name is Christopher Bond and my daughter goes to Clow Elementary School. On Tuesday, when speaking to numerous Boundary Committee members, a consistent theme heard was, we don't wanna repurpose schools, yet we feel like we need more options slash solutions to address district concerns. Since the Boundary Committee meeting on October 27th demonstrated to all of us that no further ideas or proposals were going to be forthcoming from RSP at this time, despite requests from the public and the Boundary Committee members, I finally took it upon myself after Tuesday to try to develop something on my own. 
I emailed each of you yesterday a copy of my proposal, and I know a number of you are on our Facebook pages and have possibly seen it there as well. I in no way presume that what I propose is a definitive solution to this boundary process that's consuming our district. My goal was more so to demonstrate that dramatic improvements can be made to the present concepts if the effort is put in and minor adjustments are made. Do any of us really believe the only options this district has are closing schools as in concept number one or the feeder system that exists in concept number three? You cannot expect us to believe that after nine months that this is the best that RSP could do. That more than anything is what has led to such frustration on the part of community members. I put forth a concept that RSP should have developed between the September 22nd boundary committee meeting and the October 27th one, yet they chose not to. So now the responsibility and burden falls to us in the community. I have shown you via my proposal that we can have the clean intact feeders of concept number one, the innovation spaces of concept number three, deal with the north side over capacity, address the south side under capacity, keep all of our schools open, have no construction costs at Longwood Elementary, lower the SIBC levels, and has all but one school under 95% in 2022, and all of them are under 95% in 2027. This addresses every concern that I am aware of that has been brought forth during this process. I'd like to note my plan only involves changes to 125 students, all of whom are already being moved in concept number one, and the loss of three innovation spaces. This plan requires very little time and effort to address from the present concepts and can be used as a starting point for new ideas. At this point, the ball is in your court. Since my concept addresses all stated concerns and keeps all of our schools open, if you choose to close any school in this district, you are doing so because you want to, not because you need to, and not because you didn't have other options. My hope is that you will choose correctly and keep our schools open. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeff Lindquist, followed by Claire Malloy. <clears throat> Members of the board, my name is Jeff Lindquist. I want to talk here tonight about transparency and trust. RSP presents a lot of data, and it's easy to assume with all those numbers that they're being thorough. But by peeling back the onion just a little, it's clear all they're doing is masking existing problems by creating new ones. It's a shell game with our children paying the price. From the start, they've hammered on capacity and utilization as the basis of all their conclusions. How they derive capacity is just basic math, 25 students per classroom. We're all familiar with the repurposing solution by now, but on what basis were these two schools picked? Were they poor performers, drains of district resources? No, they're both top rated, both using every classroom, but they're smaller, and this has been admitted as the only reason. That's unacceptable. I have to wonder if such a crucial decision is based on one factor, is RSP stress testing any assumptions at all? Are they bothering to gather new data or challenge themselves in the least? Here are a few ideas. Have they thought about how recent home sales or city to suburb migration in the face of COVID might change projections? Why is there no capacity accommodation for self-contained rooms? Where is the downstream study of effects on closing schools, not only on mental health, but transportation concerns, safety concerns, commuting across major streets, potential adverse impacts to schools that will have large, large student increases? And for those of us who live in an area where there's a potentially repurposed school, what becomes of that? Why at this late stage are these concepts not moving, valid questions not being answered, and no fresh ideas emerging in months? Why are we still talking about the same things? It seems like RSP is ready to go back to Kansas and leave this district with a giant mess. How are any of us supposed to trust in such a flawed and paper-thin process? It's past time to start listening to public concerns. Concept one has received virtually 100% opposition from speakers all over the district for a wealth of completely different reasons. It's terrible, just retire it. Concept three has been better received by both the committee and the public for use <coughs> of innovation spaces over school closings and less major disruption overall, but it's complicated with unnecessarily messy feeders and caveated with costly construction projects. These seem created to give RSP talking points and loaded survey questions to advance their preferred concept that no one else wants. <clears throat> I implore you, don't let this process get away from you. If RSP won't answer our questions fairly, make sure someone on the board is thinking more than a half a step ahead at all the unintended, unintended consequences this path is leading us on. We deserve better. Thank you. 
Next speaker is Claire Malloy, and she'll be followed by Serena Diaz. Hello, my name is Claire Malloy, and I'm a senior at Nico Valley High School. A group of us are coming from the second wake of an Equal Valley High School student who lost their life due to suicide. Mental health issues are a concern that will impact most, most from some point of their life. Our schools implemented a social emotional learning program where our gym teachers are supposed to advise us on mental health, but it usually ends up being 15 minutes at the beginning of class where the teacher flips through a presentation and then we move on. This is not the fault of the teachers by any means, as they are not trained to be mental health advisors. On some occasions, kids will go to the class house in search of mental health assistance. Our counselors are fantastic, but they're largely focused on academics rather than mental health support. As you know, mental health counseling requires a, complete, a, complete, a completely different skill set than academic counseling. We as students feel that we need more resources dedicated to mental health. Having counselors and social workers trained, trained specifically for adolescents would be an incredible asset. These professionals would be, just like our academic counselors, assigned to students and provide mandatory check-ins with all students. These counselors would act as advocates for the students, help end the stigma around reaching out for assistance, and give students the opportunity to address concerns. I have struggled with mental health issues since second grade after being diagnosed by a medical professional. The only reason I was able to get help that I so badly needed was because my parents were able to recognize the signs. Having th these resources would give students tool the tools that they need to cope with any struggles they may be ha having, notify a trusted adult if someone's life was at risk, and provide them with, this, with the tools needed, needed uh, to turn healthy coping to turn to healthy, healthy coping mechanisms instead of unsafe ways to find instant gratification. Having these resources available to students will create an environment where mental health is a priority. It will have, it'll be good because students are encouraged to talk about mental health struggles and the stigma surrounding mental health will be removed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Serena Diaz. Followed by Lucas Lamtana Arias. Hello, my name is Serena Diaz. Um, as you know, we I'm, I'm a senior at Niqua, and we came from a wake of a good friend um, due to suicide. Um, now, I think that um, Niqua does a good job with mental health. They are very they support their students. However, um, I feel, for example, it's not always it's not always there. For example, a couple weeks ago, um, I got sexually harassed by a relative, and the next day when I went to school, it was extremely hard to um, function and just go about my life without thinking about it. I went to go seek help from my guidance counselor because I needed space and time from class and to really talk to somebody. However, she was not there, and all of them were in meetings, even the social worker was in meetings and I just think it's really unacceptable how um, a student can be struggling at school but then their guidance counselors who are there for them won't be there for them because they're in meetings um, and I just think that if we had therapists access to therapists at school it'll be easier for people to get help um, I've struggled with depression anxiety ADHD and ADD uh, since I was in the fourth grade and it's always been a hard time finding a right therapist, and many of my friends have tried to seek help also with their depression anxiety. Um, but they never know where to go and what the step, uh, what step to take to start therapy. Um, if we can have access to therapists of you know their names, their informations um, for students to go seek, that would be, um, I think it would be a, a great thing for our school. Um, but also, I think there's a lot of student, NICO students here. We can all agree that um, whenever we have maybe a mental health, we need to take a mental health day or we have something going on, it's hard to skip school because, um, for example, when I skip school for I don't being sick, it feels like once you skip one day, it feels like you're skipping a whole week. And I just think the 
the lesson plans are good and it's not the teacher's fault the teachers are doing what their their jobs but it's just the material just goes so fast and it's so rushed that some of us students hate missing school because we feel like one day is a whole week i begged my parents to um come home from arizona for thanksgiving break um days earlier because I was so stressed about missing school where I should be enjoying a vacation. I just think um, those subjects really need to be brought up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Lucas Lantana Arias and followed by Oodling, oh, it's quite hard to read, Mala Pichi? Uday Nalapati. Uh, oh, okay. Uday Malapali. thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Lucas Lombana Arias, and I'm here as a junior from Nico Valley High School to talk about our school's relationship with mental health and how it's affecting my friends, my school, my district, and me. My entire life, I've been in all the advanced programs at the Indus District, you know, uh, AP, honors classes, all throughout high school, three years of PA in middle school and in elementary school, and my entire life, all my friends have been the, P the kids in these classes, you know, the academically gifted kids, the smart kids. Our entire lives, we've been told that we're smarter than everybody else. And that creates this environment in which we are expected to succeed and thrive academically. And if we don't, we're seen as failures. Our grades are tied to our self-worth. If, if I fail a test, I, 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 I'm a failure as a human being. My value is so connected and so intertwined with how I do academically and how my friends do academically that it's affecting my mental health, it's affecting my friend's mental health. And our school, uh, our, if I miss Calc BC for one day, I'm behind eight units and I'm still struggling to catch up from a class I missed a week ago. And that's just academically, mental health. In the past three weeks, our district has had eight deaths, two of which at Niqua were to suicide, both of which were my friends. I just came here from my friend's wake in which I saw his dead body in a casket just not even an hour ago. And two days ago, I attended my longtime teammate's funeral. Not even a month ago, my friend, a sophomore in Niqua, committed suicide. My freshman year, my best friend's sister committed suicide. I've seen more death and in my 16-year-old life than any 16-year-old should ever see. My friends and I are constantly getting sent down to the counselor. I have been sent down a dozen times in November alone. This it doesn't help at all. I'm missing class. I get sent down in the middle of a class I, in which the classes are extremely rushed and I miss anything, I'm behind. I get sent down to the class house. I sit there for 20 and 30 minutes waiting for the counselor or the social worker to be done with their meetings or whatever they're doing. And then I talk to a strange adult that I do not know about my mental health problems. And that doesn't really solve anything at all. These are people that I do not trust, that my friends do not trust. We do not feel comfortable going to them about our problems. And our school, I feel that our school does not do enough to address these issues. To combat these extreme stresses on my friends, me, and all students at Niqua, we need more funding to go to the mental health programs. We need more counselors who are qualified to deal with these issues. Three counselors for, per grade to deal with 900 students, it's, it's not enough. Our school is hurting right now. And we need a school that will agree to help us in our problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. followed by Jennifer Cortese. Hello. My name is Uday Nalapati, and I'm a junior from Nico Valley High School. Um, I've been in the quote-unquote gifted programs since third grade and currently in four APs in honors class and part of the school newspaper, my two peers, Lucas and Sachin. Um, and you might be wondering, wow, that's a lot of rigorous courses and a lot of workload for a singular student to take on. And that's exactly what I'm co covering today. Honor students like me, Lucas and Sachin, uh, have been cultivated from the very inception of our careers as IPSC 204 students to be straight A students in school and be the overachievers and take all the possible APs and honors possible to have the highest GPA uh, compared to all our surrounding peers. This leads to the fruition of several mental health issues and a feeling of unbearable pressure within a miscellany of students. And the, however, the question 
how is that the fault of the district or a school arises? And the answer is, it isn't. Not entirely. This complication in the lives of students is due to a mixture of parental pressure, school administration, and even the fault of students themselves. Students are pushed by parental pressures and fear to take an obscene amount of APs and honors classes. Um, and the thing is, with, with taking these amount of APs and honors classes, it leads to a multitude of problems mentally and physically for a wide range of students. Like Lucas has said, there have been two suicides in the span of three weeks just at Nequa, and aid is needed to quench these consistent problems plaguing the minds and bodies of students around 204. But whether you look to social workers, counselors, or even deans for this mentioned aid, an unfailing generalization can be discovered. No adequate help can be found. I also realize that putting all the blame on school admin isn't fair because some may say the sheer difference in the size of student to faculty ratio um, just doesn't allow for social workers to cover all students. And that's exactly, exactly the point. Three social workers for over 800 to 900 students in each grade just at Nequa is just not enough to cover it, to cover the mental issues plaguing many, I would say most of these students, most of these 800, 900 students at Nequa. And to end it off, I'm begging for the school board and the district to consider providing a higher quantity of aid through the mediums of social workers or counselors trained in mental health situations for the increasing number of students, because I guarantee, no, no matter how hard it may be, increasing faculty, faculty size for mental health issues is a whole lot easier than bringing back a loved one who has died. Thank you. Next speaker is Jennifer Cortez, followed by Gary Moe. This is going to be tough to follow, so forgive me. Um, this is why I'm here. My name is Jennifer Cortez, and I'm the current co-vice president of the PTA at Graham Elementary. I have two children attending Graham. I'm here tonight to encourage you to remove repurposing or closing schools as an option during a pandemic. I'm here to also repeat what many others before me have already stated. Our children are not okay. The American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association have declared children's mental health challenges amid the pandemic a national emergency. The tragedies that these children have just spoke about in our community are evidence of this crisis, and it's happening in our neighboring districts as well. In the Chicagoland area, this past week, we've learned that a total of six high school students who have taken their lives um, and we also continue to learn about more children nationally. Yet I still hear people claim children are resilient. Children living in this pandemic are not. I can tell you from firsthand experience that this isn't just a crisis among high school students. My elementary aged kids have lived the past year and a half in fear of getting sick with COVID, the chaos of remote learning, classrooms with masks, being told they couldn't play with friends or get too close to kids on the playground, and now they're hearing about the possibility of having to change schools and be separated permanently from their friends again. I don't think very many people in this room can say they experienced this level of anxiety when they were eight and six. We need to do better by our students and be on their side and not just the data side with any decision that is made. I urge you to think about what this will do to these kids if their elementary experience continues to be filled with inconsistencies and more change. My third grader is currently experiencing his third abnormal school year and if the school he is happy and thriving at is repurposed, it will be his fourth. How is this setting a good educational foundation? We have to account for the human factor in this process and think about the ripple effect it will cause. Separating the elementary kids in River Run and High Meadow would be devastating. These two communities have a 25 year history together. Furthermore, these children just got the opportunity to be together in person again, and we may have to tell them, never mind, now you have to go build a new foundation at separate schools and start all over. And if they have to start all over, they may not even have a bus to get them to Kendall and Belta because we're also in the middle of a bus driver shortage. shortage. I think the community may be understanding of this possibility of repurposing or closing schools if it was backed by a shortfall in finances, but you have stated to us that this is not the case. We also may be more understanding if this was happening in an underfunded or underperforming district, but this is also not the case. In fact, this district prides itself on its national ranking. 
So why is a nationally acclaimed school district considering repurposing or closing schools? I'll leave you with one final thought. There was a sociologist who once said, in regards to data analysis, that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Please consider this when thinking about Graham Elementary and its students. Thank you. Very well. Followed by Tallulah Thorne. Good evening. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk today. I just have a, one simple question. For the three public forums we had last week, where are the recordings of the public comments? Where did they go? <laughs> when confronted with the question online, the response was this. There's no requirement that this meeting be digitally captured. Whose requirement? We're not talking about laws and regulations here. Do you still call this a public forum? A public forum with public comments to cut off? Oh, by the way, I checked all the law books. I could not find any requirements that says a teriyaki chicken has to have a chicken. You guys are very creative. <laughs> the public comments were already being pushed to the corner during all three of the so-called public forums. Only 30 minutes were allocated to the public, with the rest rehashing the same information that has been repeated numerous times, including RSP's qualification experience, even a mathematical formula with a bunch of fancy symbols. With all the respect, I doubt even the RSP folks really understand what they mean. In order to get this one minute, one minute speaking slot, a big crowd of people lined up outside in the wind, in the wind, for two to three hours each day. And the majority could not even get a chance to talk. Even for those who, those who did manage to sign in, the last four to five people were cut off, not allowing even five more minutes to finish. As a school taxpayer myself, I really feel their anger, their frustration. They do not deserve to be treated that way. Two concepts are being discussed, and it is conceivable that your preference is different from ours. That's OK. But don't destroy our speaking records. It is our, rec it is our right to speak out our concerns. Our communities are being affected. Our children's safety and well-being are on the line. Look, you guys might have a bigger megaphone, but you're on the stage in the public eye, and your every move is in the public scrutiny. Suppressing our voice is never a smart thing to do, and it will further agonize the community and make us wonder what is the real motivation behind this. Thank you. Followed by Mark Skids Skidsgill. Hi, my name is Tula Thorne and I'm in third grade at Graham. The last normal school year I had was in kindergarten. I love my school and my teachers. Everyone is so nice and welcoming. Sometimes I wonder why adults are even talking about closing the school in the first place. It doesn't make sense to me. I moved to Graham from Patterson in 2019. Seven months into the first grade, COVID shut down everything. I spent all but six weeks of second grade learning virtually on a computer. I am now finally getting settled into third grade, and now my school might close? It's not fair to me and my friends at Graham. If you close my school, I will be sent to Bilta. I will be split up from most of my friends who would get who would go to Kendall. I live in River Run and could walk down the street to Patterson. I also live less than a mile from Kendall. Why can't I go there? My mom was even talking about moving if Graham closes so that we can stay with my friends. Why should we have to move just to stay with my community? Right now, I don't get off the bus until 4 p.m. If I go to Bilta, which is over two miles from my house, I will be on the bus for 40 minutes. This would take time away from doing basic things like having a snack, doing my homework, and going to after school activities. COVID has made me anxious about school and 
I feel a lot of pressure. At nine years old, my parents shouldn't have to explain to me in our community why kids in our community are taking their own lives. Us kids are not okay. We've been through enough. I'm begging you, please don't close my school. <laughs> that good deal, followed by Mandy Trainer. Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Skinzer. Uh, I have three kids in the 204 school district, including a third and fourth grader at Graham uh, and a seventh grader at Crone. My wife, Tracy, is president of the uh, PTA at Graham. Uh, I'd like to express my grave concerns about the disproportionately high amount of time and discussion that is spent in the Boundary Committee forums on Concept 1. Uh, while the need for a closer balance of students and classroom capacity across 204 has been demonstrated by the board, None of the analysis or goals shared by the board appear to justify closing schools. Given the committee's analysis demonstrates concept one would impact almost a third of our elementary school students and roughly 50% more students than in concept three, it is highly questionable why concept one continues to feature far more prominently in the boundary discussions and other alternatives. Ms. Donahue, you stated last week that a goal of the board is to reduce class sizes. Concept one would increase the proportion of elementary schools operating at 80% utilization or higher from just under a third today to half. Clearly, concept one is in direct conflict with your stated goal of reducing class sizes. Dr. Talley, last week you spoke to the close engagement with community parents for the formation of the Boundary Committee, which is both commendable and in line with our community values. However, public commentary, consistently in strong opposition to closing schools was omitted from the uh, public commentary, uh, from the public forum videos posted on social media. And the Boundary Palaces Community Survey created ostensibly to solicit feedback from the public is patently flawed with clearly biased questions towards concept one. Uh, this is concerning given that RSP's stated metric of a favorable response, of, of a consensus is only 51% favorable responses. Frankly, this does not appear to be consistent with open and honest engagement with your board's constituency. By the board's own admission, it currently lacks the foundation of a long-term strategic plan. Perhaps these contradictions are a symptom of a lack of a plan that fully reconciles the rezoning with the well-being of our students. Taking such sweeping actions without a clear strategic plan, as any consultant should tell you, is a flawed process. Most confounding is the continued focus on a scenario that closes school when none of the goals and objectives of the board actually require that schools be closed. We ask that the Boundary Committee abandon concept one and focus on a long-term plan and solution that better serves the comprehensive needs of the school district. Anything less would be to fail our students and our community. Thank you. Andy Trainer is up next, followed by Cecilia Lindquist. Good evening. My name is Mandy Trainer, and I'm a parent of three boys who are currently students at Nequa, Crone, and Graham. I want to thank you all for your service and efforts over this very challenging past year and a half. I'm here tonight to express my opposition to Concept One and my support of Concept Three. Concept One proposes closing and re or repurposing, repurposing two schools, Graham and Clough. While much of the discussion around this concept talks about these schools as buildings, I urge you to remember that they are so much more. Both schools are a collection of educators, many of whom have been working in these schools for decades. They have created a culture for our students along with the surrounding communities. Closing these schools puts an abrupt end to these legacies. I speak to you as a parent of a child with special needs. My youngest son is in third grade and has Down syndrome. Thanks to, in large part to the incredible administrators, teachers, support staff, and teaching assistants at Graham, my son has been meaningfully included in general education with appropriate supports since entering Graham. This has been a collaborative process between the staff at Graham and our family, where we have been welcomed as part of my son's team. This has been built and tweaked year over year to create a solid foundation for my son. He is a valued member of the Graham community. While COVID was difficult for all students, it hit students with special needs particularly hard. The team at Graham worked so hard under such challenging circumstances. 
In our case, it still meant regression for our son and behaviors at home. This school year has been such a relief as we return to almost normal. Our son is flourishing as he is back at Graham full time with a familiar structure and routine to his day. He is surrounded by a dedicated team who knows him well and how best to support him. The thought of this all coming to an end is hard to fathom. The students at Graham and Clow who have just gotten back into their routines where they feel secure would now be split from their classmates and divided among five schools. They would be pulled from the teams of educators who know them as individuals. These changes would all be made with no strategic plan for how the buildings would be repurposed, or at least not one that has been communicated to the broader district. Closing these top rated schools does not solve the overcrowded issues in the north and has no impact on the feeder system. Instead, it creates additional bus routes in a time of a driver shortage. Concept one impacts significantly more students than concept three after an unprecedented challenging time for our students. I ask you to reject concept one and support concept three, or actually, I liked your proposals tonight too. So thank you so much for your consideration. Celia Lindquist is up next, followed by Matthew Schreiner. Board. RSP claims to have a 97% accuracy, so to certain medical analysis. The biggest difference is, is that the FDA has oversight as a compliance agency. RSP rated themselves. My family rated my accuracy at 100%. This is as reliable as RSP's self-valuation. RSP claims they do work all over the Midwest. It's actually six states. Per their own client list, they monopolize a whopping 0.76% of the market less than 1% within six states. Let's not talk nationally here. The big elephant in the room. Ms. Donahue said that the pandemic highlighted the overcrowding at some North 204 schools during the pandemic. The proposed solution, crowd more schools at over 90%, especially while we're still in a pandemic. Does that make sense? I glanced at the financials and you certainly can put this off until we're on the other side of the pandemic. The board has loosely used repurposed without clearly defining its intended use or providing viable performance. Repurpose could be anything, selling, renting, timeshares. You want to push a vote on the unknown? Repurposed and closed means the same for our thing for our community, not available to our kids or the educators. RSP was able to come up with zero concepts to alleviate the overcrowding in North 204. Are we paying for mediocrity? because that's what we're receiving. I'm gonna give you an out of the box idea and it's better than zero from RSP. Why haven't you talked to Fox Valley about inline space or a creation of an out parcel for students in North 204? Retail has reinvented themselves over the years from a mall to mixed use residential, onsite hotels, fine dining, outdoor entertainment. Proposed concept one is horrendous. No one wants this. We are the community which you are supposed to represent Look around the room. Do you see community members, children, and educators? Do you actually think that most feel represented by this board? At what point of the process will you actually consider community impact and most importantly, our children? Where was your community consideration of impact during the acceptance of the watered down apology from RSP referring to us as gangrene and blatantly defining a personal bias and perceived socioeconomic difference with our neighbors? Where was your support during the boundary committee process where RSP repeatedly and blatantly ignored boundary committee member requests for alternate concepts? The boundary committee members certainly didn't seem like they wanted closed schools, but RSP would not provide additional concepts. I have to ask, was this per your direction? I do not believe there's full transparency from the board to the public. Individually, we might be small communities, but united we are a force to be reckoned with. So board, are you with us or are you against us? Matthew Schreiner, followed by Ventakesh K. Good evening, board. My name is Matthew Schreiner. I'm a proud parent of a second and fourth grade Claw Cougar and future Wildcat. I want to pause for a second to thank all the Nico Valley students that came here as 
as a parent and of students that will be in your shoes and for all of your classmates and all the future Nico Valley students, I appreciate you being here. Keep, keep speaking up and hopefully you, all of our voices are heard. This, this comes to, to what I came to talk about. That our Cougars have continued to brave the dropping temperatures to continue to support their schools. I have a second grader who has yet to know a normal school year in school, but decided that he wanted to write his message to the school board instead of watching YouTube. This is a really big deal. A fourth grader who continues to, along with her peers, hold strong with the support of her caring teachers and staff who continue to be the rock of the cloud community for students after all that COVID has thrown at them. Cougars who should be eating jello at lunch and not having table talk about whether or not their future is etched in it. Cougars who have been working to collect caps for a buddy bench at their school and not which buddy will go to another school. Students who with their wonderful teachers teach them in their individual needs and yet this process has counted them as just a number. Every, IS, every Cougar, every IPSD student has a story. Tonight I hope to remind it all, remind it, it is the students. The reason why we should continue to discuss, communicate, be transparent, consider other ideas, just like Mr. Bond brings up, not get locked into concept one or concept three since the early days of this process, being that concept one has been the only one that hasn't changed. Remember that Every discussion that is made will have ripple effects on our ch children's future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Katash K, followed by Vijay Dara. Uh, good evening, board members and all uh, parents who are present here today. I want to first of all thank the board for their services to our community. Uh, my name is uh, Venkatesh. I'm the resident of the village of Meadow Lakes community. Uh, same neighborhood as the Still Middle School. Uh, before moving to the Naperville uh, community, um, we were living in the north suburb, the District 102, Aptakisig uh, School District. So I want to share some personal experiences with the board, which the board members may or may not be uh, aware of. So uh, when my son was in fourth grade, um, school had issues with overcapacity, and they tried an idea called co teaching, where each class had two teachers, and there were 30 kids in each class. I thought that was a great concept. I, they were also supported by a full-time teaching assistant, uh, and it provided great uh, balance to the class. It also provided work-life balance from a teacher's standpoint. And personally, as parent, I saw that my son was more engaged in the classes, and he was very happy about it. So I thought that's a great uh, idea that the school could consider at some point if we ever run into those uh, scenarios. Uh, second, um, I heard in the public forums uh, both uh, Dr. Talley and Matt Shibley talk about uh, repurposing the funds uh, from the STEM school towards our uh, elementary and middle school. So uh, I was also an active member of uh, at the school from a uh, science Olympiad competition supporting at uh, District 102. And I can uh, tell you that uh, the PTAs were a great part of each of those elementary schools. So each elementary school at District 102 had a science lab where the parents, volunteers, had coaches, and they had to go through like a training session to be eligible for a uh, coaching. And uh, they would uh, support the students who would stay after, uh, after school hours to coach them and experiment, uh, do their experimentation, continuously improve the experiments to be part of the regional competition, uh, part of the Science Olympiad competition. So when we went for the regional competition at Arlington Heights, we actually had uh, participation from District 203. So I really uh, request the, I thought that is a great program. That is something that I was looking forward to. And uh, I request the uh, board members to reach out to 203 and see if that's something that we can offer to our students here and also make the best use of our funds. And lastly, uh, I just want to emphasize the community engagement and the PTA played a big role in District 102 in making sure the parents are engaged in the science uh, lab and after we're supporting those efforts and uh, as from village of meadow lakes we already have pta board members as well as the communities already engaged and we thought like keeping us under owen elementary will 
make sure we support the board's uh, uh, goal of making the maximum use of the funding resources. So th that's kind of my request from my end as parent and it's also Danny giving some ideas. speaker's time has Thank ended. You. Thank you. EJ Dara is up next, followed by Samra Saha. Good evening, board members. My name is Vijay Dara. I'm a resident of Mission Oak subdivision, which is very close to both Welch and Nikwa Valley. I attended last week's three meetings held in Wabounsi, Nikwa, and Mitia about the boundary meeting. And uh, one thing I noticed is everybody unanimously rejected concept one, and everybody unanimously accepted concept three. <coughs> And uh, why did people unanimously accept concept three? They, they based not their decision not on some complex data analysis that RSP did. They made their decision based on some simple common sense things. For example, when everything else is kept same, if somebody asks, do you want to commute less to your school or far away from your school, everybody will choose less to your school and people are already traveling short distances to their school, why would they want to go to a faraway school? Nobody wants to do that. That's a simple common sense thing. And everything else kept same. <coughs> if somebody asks, you want to have a safe commute to your school or a dangerous commute to your school, people will say, I want a safe commute. Why would I want to choose a dangerous commute by crossing Route 59 or crossing <coughs> railroad tracks or causing busy intersections. Again, this also people made decision based on common sense. And when, when people are asked, everything else kept same, do you want your school friends to be near your house or very far away from your house? People will say, I want all my school friends to be near my house. Again, common sense thing. So people made decisions based on simple common sense. I understand RSP did a lot of data complex analysis but it should not ignore common sense. Common sense should still be taken into consideration. Another common sense thing, one of the <coughs> criteria for boundary meetings is not to create islands, but if you look at my Mission Oak subdivision, I have Route 59 on the west, and I have big shopping complexes on the north, and I have forest preserve and golf course on the east, and I have one close neighborhood on the south. But what did RSP do? They moved the south neighborhood to Nikwa Valley and north neighborhood to Wabonsi. So that is also gone. So now we are an island. So the whole purpose of this boundary exercise is to solve island problem, but they are creating more islands. And in the beginning of the meetings, in the beginning of the three meetings, somebody said on the stage that North side is overcrowded. North schools are overcrowded. South schools are underutilized. So what do you think? Ms. Donahue, speaker's time has ended. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Samra Saha, followed by Owen Benhauer. Good evening, board members. Uh, I am here this evening, uh, actually, uh, to read a letter, passionate letter that my daughter wrote. Uh, so. Um, here it goes. Uh, I'm Anushka Saha, a seventh grader living in Mission Oaks. Apologize I cannot come to the meeting tonight, uh, but I'm sending this letter to my father so that this can be read to you all. First of all, I'd like to thank you for appointing great teachers in our school. In our school, we are taught by the same teachers very three important life lessons. First one is value time, be fair, and take every opportunity provided by the education system. Under concept one, kids from my community will be sent to schools that are over four miles away, instead of attending our neighborhood schools that are only about, about a mile away. That too, when our local schools are currently under capacity. With both my parents working full time, they'll be unable to drive me before and after school activities due to significantly longer commute time across busy highways, traffic signals, railroad crossings, which I won't have to worry about by going to my local schools. 
this lost opportunity will deprive me of my future academic success relative to my peers. I am writing to you here tonight because my teachers taught me to be fair and speak up against any injustice so that no one can bully others regardless of their position or power. Unlike adults, we don't have a salary. For us, time is money. But our commute time is being increasing over four folds. Just imagine, how would you feel if your salary will be reduced by over four folds? Finally, a guiding principle that my teachers taught me was, if you ever have to choose between being right and being kind, always choose to be kind over being right. Because if you are kind, you will always be right. Thank you very much. Owen Benhauer, followed by Fata Satipa. First off, I'd like to thank the board for allowing us to speak tonight. My name is Owen Beinhauer, and I'm currently a senior at Nico Valley. Living in an affluent area such as Naperville, the expectations of students academically are at a much higher standard. With Nico Valley High School being named a Blue Ribbon School, those expectations were once again raised, causing an even more competitive environment. While I don't disagree that school should be a place where students strive to be their best and are challenged, that isn't all school should be. Most students are aware that there is a guidance counselor or a social worker for them in the class house, but very few have the opportunity to use them. With a class size of almost 900 students per grade, it is impossible for each student to quickly and efficiently use these resources, as is a ratio of 300 students to one guidance counselor. Many students experiencing mental health struggles are sent to the class house to quickly resolve their issues. Because of the amount of people assigned to each counselor, there's usually a wait to meet with them. I believe each student should have a quarterly check-in with their assigned counselor or social worker just to check in on their mental health. Then, if there's an issue in the school, a student and the social worker will have a previously established relationship and will be able to resolve this issue quicker and with a more personal response. This is not the fault of the guidance counselors, as they have been trained to be more college and after high school resources. But many feel like they do not have they do not have a mental health counselor, only someone to provide them with academic assistance. A saying that has been used to normalize mental health is stop the stigma. But most, if not all, of the action is being taken place from the students, not the system as a whole. One example is simply the use of space in hallways. There is so much opportunity to put up posters and quotes to send us positive messages of ending the stigma around mental health. But instead, we have blank or outdated walls. For an example, the Burkett Freshman Center. I currently have two classes at the Freshman Center and I attended my entire freshman year at the Freshman Center. There are display cases that still have images of the senior PE leaders that helped teach classes while I was a freshman that have not been updated. Students' art pieces from 2005 are still displayed on the wall. The current freshmen weren't even alive in 2005. These are just two examples of spaces that can be better used to inspire, motivate, and upbring the current student body. Many would agree that spending a minimum of 35 hours per week at school would call for some sort of mental health support, just like benefits, similar to dental insurance or a 401k that many fortunate adults receive with their 40-hour work weeks. Schools are made to prepare students for living in the real world, and taking care of mental health is a challenge that most of us will face in our adult life. Schools should be at the front line when it comes to the battle of mental issues in America, and District 204 should be the first in action. Thank you. Thank you. Atta Senapate is next, followed by Rafia Quadri. We have Bata. Respected school board president and members, Dr. Tally and my fellow community members. My name is Bata Senapati and I live in Mission Oak subdivision that is between 87th and 83rd Street in Naperville. I am here this evening to talk about the school boundary topic. I have sent you several emails with problems and possible solution options. Thank you for reading those emails. I spoke in the public forum where I said how concept one would break our neighborhood and contradict several boundary criteria. I have interacted with the several boundary committee members where I suggested to keep Mission Oaks and Aerostead with Welch and Nicoa, readjust the Kendall and Peterson 
to create a win-win solution for the school board and the community. A lot has been spoken over the last several weeks, months, and especially last week in the public forums, and I do not intend to reiterate those points here tonight. My comment today will be somewhat philosophical in nature. We all feel good and proud of to live in the community that appears in the list of countries' top 50 places to live. You have a clear choice ahead of you to make, and your choice will decide if that tradition will continue or not. You heard all the feedbacks and reasons in last week's forums where by absolute majority of the folks across the school district favored concept three over concept one. Mostly the arguments were fact-driven, some were principle-driven, and some, of course, were emotionally charged. One thing has not been spoken enough last week. There is one concept, and that is concept one, that is reactive and proposes to close some school, breaks our neighborhood, and most importantly, sends a dark signal to the communities around the state and in the country that Naperville is a dying city and is not a destination to raise kids anymore. Imagine the possibilities that are in front of you. You can turn the extra space into STEM and innovation space the way you have in concept three. In each and every school, the art of possibilities it creates for the kids early stage in the academic life is huge. It clearly would put two of four school district in a competitive edge. Concept three is the path to the future. Encouragingly, we heard from Dr. Talley and Mr. Shipley that we can afford those programs. We have money. So I, I, I humbly encourage you all to choose the path to the bright future for our kids and community over being stagnant. Let's turn the crisis of declining enrollment to the new opportunities for the kids. So please adopt concept three or modify concept one to make it future looking and less disruptive. disruptive. Thank you all for listening to me. Afia Quadri is the next speaker, followed by Arvind Pramu. Good evening, board members and everybody else. Um, I am a resident of Wagner Farms community. We uh, sit on 103rd Street. And uh, currently, my, I have two kids. Uh, my older one goes to first grade at Kendall. Um, under the concept one, we risk losing Kendall to Welch. And um, I'm not sure why that's being done. Uh, our community is fairly new. It was constructed a year and a half ago. And we moved in primarily because of the schools. Um, before moving into Naperville, a number of our family members discouraged us to move into Naperville, saying that so many schools are overcrowded. But we believe that uh, being on the south of Naperville, we won't have to face that problem. Um, now, Concept 3 has gotten a lot of traction, and under Concept 3, we will remain with Kendall, which we would like simply because it's uh, so many of the kids from our community actually bike to school. Uh, on a good day, you can actually walk to. And um, moving us to Welch doesn't make sense under Concept 1, simply because um, the buses will have to travel through much busier streets. Um, um, and I am surprised that um, Wagner Farm is actually being, doesn't, is not being given an option under uh, either one or three to remain with Crone Middle School. Uh, under both options, we've been proposed Scala and Middle School simply because it sits so close to our community. However, um, I was looking through the numbers um, and right now, Scullin is the only middle school that's um, operating at 100% capacity. And even under concept three, um, it would still operate or hover at around 80, 85% yeah, for the projected time period. Um, I don't see why we should not stay with Crone Middle School. Um, I had requested some of the data from our community. Our community is very small. The, once completed, there'll be around 300 homes, and right now there are uh, just 35 students going to Crone and 100 students going to uh, Kendall. So uh, today I'm here to request that you uh, uh, allow us to stay with Kendall, which is much closer, um, a place where my son has adjusted well into, and uh, Crone, uh, because 
uh, it's one of the schools that is that will remain uh, under capacity. Um, it will be around 80 percent, uh, even if we were to be uh, even if we were to stay with Crone. Um, again, uh, most kids that go to Kendall continue on with Crone and are not moved to Scullin, so that results in also a broken feeder system. So um, yes, I hope uh, you would consider us. We're small. Our request is also not too big an ask. So thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Our 20th speaker is Arvind Pur Purumal. Um, Jeannie, will we have time for a 21st speaker? We will. Okay, so we'll go for 21. Good evening. Uh, my name is Arvind Purumal. I'm a resident of village Villages of Meadow Lakes community. Uh, first of all, I sincerely thank you, board members, uh, you know, uh, uh, for your service. Uh, I'm here to talk about the boundary changes. Um, I want you to know our community strongly supports Concept 3. It's mainly because of the proximity uh, to our school. The proposed concept would uh, in, under Concept 3 would, ch would send our children to White Eagle Elementary, which is considerably closer than our current school. And also, it helps in keeping our subdivisions together. So the proposed uh, concept three would keep our community, Stonehaven and Chicory Place, our neighboring community, for the same elementary school. So these subdivisions run continuously between each other and our families in this community is rely on each other for transportation, activities, et cetera. That said, um, our, our, our community strongly opposes concept one. Um, uh, it's not a choice, mainly because it's, it creates a separation of our neighboring subdivisions. At the elementary school level, this concept creates our, uh, create, separates our Stonehaven and Chicory Place subdivisions remaining at Urban Elementary. Concept 1 unnecessarily swaps kids between their current schools within our community. This also creates fractions among our larger community to go to three separate elementary schools. Also, in the proposed concept 1, elementary school students would have to pass a railroad crossing, um, which, would, which, would, which would be an obstacle in driving students to the school and will affect our community. Uh, commute time. Uh, so that said, I, I sincerely thank you again for your service as a board member. It's not an easy job, um, and you have some tough decisions to make ahead of you, but I want you to be aware uh, that you would make our life and our, and our kids' life easier by choosing Concept 3. Thanks for the opportunity. Last speaker is Peter Sluman. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Schumann. I'm a senior at Nico Valley. Um, you've heard many other speakers talk about the need for better uh, student mental health options at our school, and I feel like I just need to talk about it as well. So uh, Indian Prairie School District 204 has had a rough few weeks with a total of eight students in 204 that took their own life this year. At my high school, Nico Valley, we lost two wonderful friends, brothers, and classmates to suicide. Gabe Corey was only in his sophomore year of high school. I didn't know him very well, but he and I were both on equal wrestling. Whenever Gabe showed up to practice, he always gave 110%. He always wrestled at his hardest, and he always did his best, and that's what was expected of him, and that's what he did. Matthew Nash was in his junior year of high school. I didn't know him, but we had mutual friends, and one of those friends afterwards was constantly acting, asking himself, what could I have done? Is there anything I could have done to prevent this from happening? The other mutual friend has already been battling mental health issues. The day after uh, Nash took his own life, he texted me asking if I was all right, saying he couldn't lose anyone else. Many students are aware of ways to help their mental health, but it is those that believe they don't need help from others that are the most vulnerable. I call on the school district to have more counselors and recommend professional therapists for students that need mental health who need it most. They also need to create more options for students to reach out for help, but still protect their uh, identities and remain anonymous. The stigma around still affects many individuals that believe that they have to act a certain way around their fellow peers. One of these ideas includes after-school Zoom calls with counselors, which I believe could help benefit protecting students and uh, their identities from others that may believe that they're not as big a man as they pretend to be. What we as students are worried about is a snowball effect where all we receive is bad news for the next few weeks and even the next few months 
All we hear is about another lost friend. It is time to say enough is enough and help prevent student suicide in District 204. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report. Ms. Donahue, members of the Board of Education and the Indian Prairie community, as been mentioned by many students tonight, we do come to you with sad news. Um, out of privacy concerns, I will not mention the name of the student. However, I want us to, we did lose a student, and I want us to take a moment of silence now for reflection and contemplation about our students and about what was said tonight. Thank you. I appreciate what the students uh, said tonight. I can say that as a district, we are very concerned about mental health. In fact, tomorrow we will be meeting with the three high school principals to talk about how we can augment what we're already doing in our schools. We want to come to it from a three-pronged approach, working with staff and building their capacity helping students, and also our community. Our schools currently have mental health professionals in the buildings. However, I know what the students are saying. The issue is we don't have as many as we should have. This is a national issue, one that has been around for several years as we continue to struggle to find additional psychologists, social workers, and others with the skill sets. With that said, though, we currently do have our professional school counselors, we have our social workers, we have our psychologists, and we have our mental health coordinators in all of our high schools. Those people are there and available to support. Last year, we did a parent, advisor, a parent academy, and we had those people present to talk about what resources they have and how they can support families as well. We will continue to work on this and um, come forward with some more um, support. As I have said in our prior updates, Indian Prairie School District is piloting the Test to Stay program option in four of our schools. I'm sharing with you tonight that we are expanding that program to all of our elementary schools and middle schools. Under the Test to Stay program, parents, if they so choose, are able to have their children participate in COVID testing if exposed to someone who is positive in their classrooms. Under this program, students, if they uh, test negative throughout the testing period, they can stay in school. I'm very happy that we had this in place because already we have students who are able now to stay in school because of the test to stay program as opposed to having to be out in quarantine. The program is only available to students when they are consistently wearing their mask um, and um, only for unvaccinated students in our schools. Uh, it is the method that the state has allowed going forward. I also want to thank very much our nurses because of the work that they are doing on this. Our nurses are doing the testing for the program, the swab test. Without their, uh, without their presence, without their work, we would not be able to do this. And our nurses are truly angels of mercy, and I appreciate all that they're doing to make sure we're able to do this. <laughs> District 203 and 204 recently had a vaccine clinic uh, for children ages 5 to 11. All 2,000 spots were filled. Um, at this time, we're not certain we'll be able to do another clinic. It depends upon uh, Joel Osco, the company with whom we were working. Um, and if we are able to do one, we will let people know. I will end my comments tonight to say that November 15th is School Board Members Day. There is a resolution that I'd like to read. Whereas school board members are elected to sit in trust for their diverse communities and in that capacity are charged with meeting the community's expectation and aspirations for the public education of their children and 
whereas school board members are entrusted with the guardianship and wise expenditure of scarce tax dollars and they are responsible for maintaining and preserving the buildings, grounds, and other areas of the school district that the community has put in their trust. And whereas school board members are responsible for providing leadership that ensures a clear, shared vision of public education for their schools, that sets high standards for the education of all students, and requires the effective and efficient operations of their districts and whereas school board members adopt public policy to give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer board policy and are also responsible for the regular monitoring of the district's performance and compliance with state policy and whereas school board members selfishly volunteer countless hours to public service with no compensation and whereas school districts have faced enormous challenges over the past two years and the strong, dedicated leadership provided by the Indian Prairie School District Board of Education has allowed student learning and success to continue, and whereas employers are supportive of their employees who serve as school board members, generously lending support and time, employers give their employees the opportunity to better serve the needs of the school districts and communities they represent through sometimes tremendous sacrifice to the employer, and whereas decisions made by school board members directly impact the quality of life and safety in their communities, placing them at the front line of American democracy, therefore be it resolved by Indian Prairie School District 204 that we proclaim November 15, 2021 as School Board Members Day as a way to honor these citizens who devote their time and energy for the successful education of our children and future leaders. What I appreciate most about this board is their thoughtful approach to decisions it has to make. This Board of Education is very professional in its approach to handling difficult decisions. Board of Ed members may not always agree, but they are able to disagree professionally and continue to work to serve the community and our students. You do not always see that, see that happening in other districts in Illinois across the country, and we are lucky to have this very functioning Board of Education. Now back to you, Ms. Donahue. Thank you so much for that beautiful honor. So I think we're all touched by that. The resolution was almost as long as our oath of office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next we move to our consent agenda item. I need a motion to approve consent agenda items D through H. I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda items D through H as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Just one comment. We're finishing up phase five of the air conditioning, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> or phase six, I'm sorry. Okay, Jeannie, will you call the roll? Mr. Rising. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Mr. Krubus. Yes. Ms. Fosdick. Yes. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Jane. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Yes. The motion passes. Okay, our next item is our action items. I need a motion and a second to approve the tentative 2021 tax levy. Susan, I, I move that we approve the tentative 2021 tax levy as presented. Is there a second? Second, Allison. Any discussion? Okay, Jeannie, will you take the yeah. roll? Ms. Deming? Aye. Or do I go first? Or Ms. Fazdick? Oh, we didn't ask any, oh. so many questions. Oh, wait. Okay. No, we'll just wrap it up. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Go, yeah, go no, ahead. <laughs> no problem. I'll uh, just, just read the annual uh, spiel here. So, <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, tonight, we are taking the first step in the process that will result in the extension of our annual property tax <laughs> levy. The Illinois School Code gives the authority to boards of education to levy a tax on the real property within the district to support its public schools. This is an annual process that must occur by the end of December. Furthermore, the Truth in Taxation Law provides that if a tentative levy exceeds 105% of the prior year's tax extension, a public notice and hearing are needed before the official levy can be adopted. 
Since our levy request represents less than a 5% increase, we are not subject to the truth in taxation law. However, we still intend to follow the intent of this law. Therefore, 20 days prior to the adoption of the final levy resolution, the school board must estimate and announce a tentative levy for the amount of money they deem necessary to be raised by the property taxation. It is this tentative levy that we are asking the board to approve tonight. I am recommending the board set a tentative levy in the amount of $326,548,436. This includes the bond and interest levy. The bond and interest levy is set at $27,325,000. This is the estimated bond and levy amount in accordance with our bonded debt. This levy is simply a request. While this represents a 3% increase over the 2020 levy extension, the district is subject to property tax cap legislation. We will not receive a 3% increase. Over the past 30 years, the Property Tax Extension Limitation Law, or PTEL, has limited property tax increases in DuPage and Will County to the amount of CPI. Depending on the amount of new property, the district should experience approximately 2.2% increase of final extension. That 2.2% would include a consumer price index amount of 1.4%. This was the consumer price index for the 2020 calendar year. The remaining 0.8% would be related to new property. Uh, in dollars, this represents approximately a $7 million increase from the prior year extension, of which 3.9 would come from the consumer price index increase and 3.1 million would come from new property. Under PTEL, CPI has become the critical factor, not the tax rate, when the county sets the property tax bills for individual homeowners. The rate is lowered or raised by the tax cap formula based on that CPI cap. We do expect tax rates will drop this year as property tax values have increased in both Will and DuPage counties. We are estimating DuPage's EAV, or equalized excess value, have increased by 2% and wills have increased by 1.6%. Therefore, for 2021, the average tax holder should experience a 1.4% increase in taxes paid, as that's the amount of CPI, and a slight decrease in their property tax rate. Tonight's levy is based on fiscal year 2023 budget forecasts. Current projections for fiscal year 2023 suggest increases in costs related to CPI across district operating funds. That is why that is the justification for this increase. The 2021 levy year this year is the first year of Public Act 102-0519. This law was signed in, into law by Governor Pritzker over the summer, and this act requires that the county clerk extend a supplemental levy on behalf of the school district for assessment loss due to certificate of errors or board of review and property tax appeal decisions. There's no action needed taken by this board in related to this act. I do anticipate the impact of this law to have a very minimal impact on our district and our taxpayers as we historically collect 99.8% of our property taxes each, each year. And um, both our counties have been very proactive in resolving appeals prior to the extension of property taxes. So although we are not subject to the truth in taxation law this year, we are still intending to hold a public hearing prior to board ad adoption. This hearing will occur at the beginning of the December 6th board meeting. So with that, at this time, administration recommends the board adopt the 2021 levy as presented. So now do we have any questions? I'd just like to make a statement. Um, for our community, it's important to know that the reason property taxes in Illinois are so high is because Illinois funds education 50th in the United States. Illinois has pushed that burden onto home property taxpayers. Furthermore, school districts cannot increase property taxes and have to stay capped within CPI. As Matt had just mentioned, that is going to be 1.4%. However, because assessments have gone up, that will actually receive less than CPI, and residents should see their overall 
portion of their school district overall tax rate drop a little bit. Is that what you said? Uh, that, that's correct. So if you compare that 1.4% CPI with uh, projected increases in the counties of around 1.6 to 2%, that, that would be that slight decrease. Okay. And we've seen that pretty consistently since, since 2011, where our property values have risen um, quicker than CPI, resulting in a declining rate. So where I was kind of going with that <laughs> is that if people see a higher percentage increase, that they should talk to their assessor because we, are, we can only levy at a maximum of CPI. That, that's correct. Yeah, that, those, those numbers or estimates are for the counties as a whole. So individual properties obviously can, can increase above that or increase below that or, or possibly decrease in value. And that, that does impact the individual um, assessment on each property. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, um, Matt. I had asked some questions about um, special education with the levy. And just on the, um, what is the percentage of our general education budget that actually goes to, because you did indicate that some of that does go to special education. What, what's the, what does that break out? Uh, sure, and I uh, if you have, if, if you should have should have knew this was coming, right? Um, we have a, we spend about fifty. Uh, I think in the budget for twenty twenty two, we budgeted uh, over fifty three million of special education expenditures, and our s dedicated special education levies only sixteen uh, and a half million. Um, some of that remaining is made up of of state and federal grants, but that that largest portion is that general piece of that levy. Um, and again, part of the um, part of when we construct the levy and choose our ask between the individual's funds is um, that there's some strategy there. And in general, the, the general education gives us just the most flexibility because that is money we can use for anything. So we can use it to cover special education. We can use it to cover um, some of the other restricted levies as well. So So the strategy has generally been to make sure that we're maximizing that general education levy and then you know, potentially levying a little bit lower in some of those restricted amounts as a result. Okay, thank you. Just a point of clarity on the CPI increases. We are, we are limited to 5% though, so if CPI was eight or some horrible number above five, <laughs> we still would be limited to, so we can't always follow even the CPI. That, that's correct. That, the CPI, uh, again, it trails a year. So this year we're, we're levying based on the 2020 CPI. So that's why it is 1.4%. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's in the news everywhere now that CPI is, is well above that. And it, I, I have seen reports that I think 6.2% is what, what was released last week. So uh, this time next year, we could be talking about um, not getting that full CPI percent. And that would be the first time I believe that's happened um, since that PTEL law came, came into action about 30 years ago. And also just one other thing that there was a couple of years back in 2010 through 2012 where CPI was flat. And while district expenses were going up, we were receiving no additional revenue. And that extremely hurt us because we are 80% of funding of where we should be. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's correct. We, uh, you know, and ironically, just how much things have changed over the last year, we were concerned about a negative CPI um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were looking at how that would potentially impact our levy. And now we're here a little over a year later worried about the opposite problem, about going above that 5% cap. All right, Jeannie, now will you call the roll? Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Fosdick. Yes. Mr. Karubis. Yes. Ms. Jane. Yes. Mr. Rising. Yes. Ms. Grover. Yes. And Ms. Donahue. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Our next item is Mr. Doug Icarius will be presenting um, our review on summer learning. Good evening, Dr. Talley and Board of Education members. Um, 
I appreciate having the time this evening. Uh, as you probably recall, uh, last year we expanded our summer of learning uh, to support students who were uh, adversely affected and we really tried to approach how we could support uh, as many students as possible, but looking at our students who really uh, were struggling and how we could uh, really provide a type of uh, on-ramp for when we were going to uh, start uh, back at school this year. So tonight I'm just going to review a little bit about how uh, some logistics of how the summer went last year and then our early planning for uh, this upcoming summer and how we would like to expand it if possible. So uh, for the summer of 2021, our focuses were to provide additional support for students who've been adversely impacted during the previous school year uh, to boost their academic and executive skills as they prepare for the 2021-22 school year. Uh, a lot of that too was just building and building upon the relationship. Test. All right. <laughs> I was gonna thought I was gonna have to use coach's voice. Might not work. <laughs> viewers. Um, also to provide credit recovery options. Uh, provide tools for. Thank you. Maybe bring it closer. All right. Okay. Provide 204 online courses for high school credit. So those were our goals for last summer. Uh, some logistics, uh, last year was our first summer that we had the 21st Century Grant. This was uh, Beyond the Bell program, uh, and that was a grant we received. I can tell when it's gone out, sorry. Uh, it's a grant we had received uh, where uh, the only schools that would qualify is if we had uh, any uh, buildings that had over 40% that were low income. It was 150000 per year per school. Uh, it was a, a pretty heavy-duty grant process that we applied for. We received it, so we received uh, $300,000. Uh, it is actually renewable for five years for a total of $1.5 million. Uh, and so we are now in the second year of our Beyond the Bell grant. Uh, for last summer, it did go um, throughout June uh, at Georgetown and Longwood. Uh, we had our summer lit camp and camp invention. Uh, at this, uh, later in the summer, we started our academic, academic boost. You want us to switch you, to another You could one? go over there, possibly. I don't know how I'm going to click. <laughs> we can hear it. I'll click. I got it. All right, so for Academic Boost, uh, we did that later in July. As we said, we wanted that kind of the on-ramp to the start of the new school year. That was at various elementary schools across the district, uh, and it had really a cross-curricular student engagement opportunities. We really wanted to build uh, relationships with students as uh, we also tried to focus on some of their uh, literacy and math uh, concerns. Uh, we identified students first. We looked at how many teachers we had available to, uh, who were able to teach during the summer. Uh, and then from there, uh, we looked at how many students per grade level uh, we could serve. Um, we were able to get enough staff to uh, provide those services at seven of our elementary schools. Uh, this did uh, relate to quite a bit of busing uh, to get as many students served as possible, and I'll go into the specifics on the next slides. So uh, first, with our uh, uh, 21st century grant, we did meet the needs of 152 students uh, who came for the summer. Um, and just for a little outcome on this one, uh, we're fortunate uh, that we had a video uh, to be able to put together uh, to show a little bit about Thank you, perfect. A little bit about our Beyond the Bell program. Club Inventions 
like you get to have fun, make your own things. You can make toys, you can make a toy car and everything. You even can make catapults with rubber ducks. You get to play with your own microphone. It's pretty fun. Club Invention is a is a club that allows for students to be able to be creative. It's STEM based. Every year it's a little different. This particular year we actually had Road Rally, Solar Bop, Open Mic, and then we also had Duck Chuck. My favorite part was the car because you can make different kinds of things from the car. One was a propeller and the other one was a pulley. And I think that was really cool. Club Invention is only possible with the help of money. This grant made it possible for our Title I students to be able to have this opportunity to be able to do this STEM program. STEM is important for our students because that's so much of what their future may hold for them. And I think exposing them at an early age and getting their thoughts moving and flowing in that direction is just so important for their future. I joined the club invention because I wanted to do a bunch of fun things that I didn't think that I would actually do. And then once I started doing club invention, I just wanted to stay here. Great, and we will be uh uh, doing that summer program again this year with our camp invention uh, through the 21st century grant We're actually that's a grant that goes throughout the year where we do after school programming uh, We also do before school programming uh, and looking at for all different opportunities where we can provide additional opportunities uh, for students um, our academic boost, we ended up serving uh, 525 students ended up coming uh, during that month of July in that first week of August um, the program provided literacy and math instruction and practice to build students' confidence uh, before the beginning of the school year. Just a little bit of feedback really helped my child during the summer break and get ready for the school year. Uh, sad that this is the last day uh, from a student who loves coming there. Uh, and, and students really enjoyed the extra attention and fun activities. We are uh, monitoring these students and, and looking at how they're progressing during the year as well. One of the big things is just relationships that were built. Uh, and right now we have just anecdotal information, but as we continue throughout the year, after we get the first semester, see how they're progressing in their classes and whatever assessment data we get, we'll continue to see how those students uh, are performing. At the middle schools, uh, we had a similar approach, same time period. Uh, so we had our cross-curricular uh, learning, reading of high interest text, STEM, uh, experiential hands-on activities, physical education, SEL. Uh, we were doing you know, field trips. We were doing uh, different opportunities of you know, growing things outside and just uh, connecting with students, uh, but tying in a lot of those academic areas at the same time. A lot of this was just you know, really trying to form relationships, uh, and we aligned it with the middle school model of supporting the whole child. For that program, we did serve 220 students. Um, our outcomes, once again, were positive feedback from students, staff, and families. Students seeking out support due to relationships built last summer. They're noticing that right in the beginning of this school year. Strong connections with families has been beneficial in supporting students and increased school participation from students who attended summer um, enrichment. They did see that this did quite a bit for building uh, relationships and trust. At the high school, we had our summer bridge, uh, same time frame. Once again, these were all just a, a couple weeks before our new school year started. Uh, program at each of the three high schools focusing on helping freshmen enter our schools more confident and prepared for success. Uh, focused on academics as well as growth mindset, advocacy and belongingness. A little bit just getting used to uh, the high school. Um, credit recovery, uh, we had held that in both June and uh, in late July through the beginning of August, and this assisted students that may have fallen behind in credits last school year, uh, provided opportunities to earn credit using the APEX software with guidance from our teachers uh, through the learning uh, process. Um, you know, we, we, we have credit recovery in place 
um, you know, to support our students who do fall behind. We did see last year more students fall behind and felt like we, need to, we needed to enhance that over the summer um, to help our students uh, really kind of get caught up on those credits. For the summer bridge, we had 134 students participate. Uh, served as a great transition from eighth grade to ninth grade, particularly helpful for uh, students that were remote learners for all of eighth grade. Um, credit recovery, we had 182 students earning 293 semester credits. Um, and some of the feedback there was just teacher support and academic coaching, uh, very valuable, gave students an alternate pathway to remain on track towards graduation, and students earned their way back through uh, focused work. Uh, um, oftentimes in that one, you know, some of those are uh, very traditional with, a, you know, trying to follow a program that helps the students and, and guide them. But a lot of this is based on how did students perform in those uh, classes. You know, some a student might have finished with a 62%, and so they just need a little bit that gets them over to get the credit for the class. They might have got an incomplete for some reason, and they're down many classes. You'll see here if we had 180 students but 293 classes, we had a lot of students that took two credits uh, during the summer. Uh, you know, to get back on track. So it was really, um, it did a lot also to support them. Uh, I think we all know what it feels like as you start to get behind and the weight that that presents and this was an opportunity to help students really get caught up and to feel like they're back on track. Our 204 online learning, uh, these are all the courses that we offer. This is a continuation. Um, unlike the other ones, this is a tuition-based course that our students can take a full course with us but take it over the summer. We did offer, uh, do offerings in both June and July. Um, and you'll see from this that it was very uh, popular last summer. Um, when you see the breakdown there, we had 1,645 uh, students take courses. Um, I think last year, uh, when our last presentation to the board, we were at about 1,200 at that time and said we're typically around 1,400, I think, and we ended up with uh, over 1,600 students who took advantage of that. Um, and you see some comments there both from a, a student as well as a teacher. Um, and a lot of them, it just it helps so they can decide if they want to take a different class during the course of the year um, or to ease their schedule. So the COD partnership, um, these are all different courses offered through COD. It's tuition uh, to COD. Um, most of the time it is our uh, teachers who are teaching those courses. We did not have any classes that had enough students to open up last year. Uh, you might recall that the summer before we did not have any, but that's because of uh, when things first had kind of uh, closed down due to COVID. Um, and prior to that, it had started to wane a little bit. We um, are not gonna offer COD courses this summer. We are looking at right now what um, courses we might be able to offer ourselves uh, to support students. There are some uh, courses that we, we, we've not recommended in the past even for students to take through COD just because uh, we might want that foundation to be done. Uh, like an algebra um, one is a foundation that we really, it's, it's such a strong foundation for math that we don't want it to be done in a short summer period, uh, but done throughout the school year. And so we're working now to see which of those courses or which popular ones in the past that we could also offer over the summer for students as we look at possible enrichment opportunities. Financials, uh, when I came to you last year about potential amounts that we could spend on, uh, and this was out of our federal funding, uh, as you know, uh, we had a CARES 1, uh, then we had ESSER 2, and then ESSER 3. Um, and so we're uh, looking at opportunities to support students with that funding when uh, we didn't know what it was gonna look like over the summer. We didn't know how many staff we'd have available. We didn't know how many students were gonna participate. Uh, we did have a lot of students that also, they either needed a break from school or had other things going on in the summer. And so um, all said and done uh, through um, the tuition free programs there we had 1,061 students who took advantage of our academic skills boost, credit recovery, and summer bridge. Um, and we spent 323,000. You'll see almost half of that is on transportation uh, when you look at the breakdowns there. Um, and, but we were able to provide transportation for students needed transportation. I think that was a big deal. Uh, this will all come out of the federal funding that we received through the grants. 
Uh, last year, uh, when I presented to you, I think my ballpark estimate was around 520,000. Uh, we didn't know how many sections. At that time, we were going to see if we can get all 21 elementary schools going. Uh, that, that just didn't uh, play out that way. Uh, so we did spend uh, approximately 323,000. Um, the only asterisks I had there were on the final column that uh, with transportation, it was hard to separate it by group because we did a lot of sharing of buses and trying to figure out all those routes. Um, we do know that we spent about 153000 in transportation across all programs. All right, so for this upcoming summer, obviously we're, we're early in that process. Uh, we are once again looking at how we can provide uh, additional supports for students who continue, continue to be most adversely impacted over the past couple of years who we see are still struggling. Um, we do, it, you know, uh, several questions that have come up, how, how are we identifying those um, students? Um, whatever minimal, you know, assessment data we have, we're looking at that data. We're looking at students who might be in our problem solving or multi-tiered system uh, service of supports processes and looking at the students who need the most support as we try to prioritize um, how we identify students um, to get those supports. Uh, knowing that, we also this summer wanted to make sure we uh, tried to um, increase our summer opportunities and see what kind of enrichment um, opportunities we can also be providing this summer. We do plan that our students who um, need those supports, like the academic boost, uh, the credit recovery courses, that we um, are looking at that being tuition-free again um, to support those students who most need it. Um, and we would look at that for transportation as well because we know that that is, plays a big part in it is making sure we can get them there. Um, we're looking at what our enrichment opportunities are going to be um, at that same time. Um, so as I said, uh, we'll, we'll provide additional support in those areas um, and we continue to, you know, we'll do that again this uh, summer uh, and try to meet as, uh, the needs of as many students as we possibly can. Uh, we do feel like we'll have those dates out earlier this year than we did last year, which might also help in some of the summer planning. We did see it as a really good way to do that a couple weeks before the school year started, just to really get them uh, uh, back into kind of school mode at that time. We'll continue to offer our 204 online courses for high school credit. As you saw that those, were, uh, those remain popular and we'll continue uh, to offer those courses. Some, uh, you know, obviously one of the enrichment ones that will stay in place for next year also is that 21st Century Beyond the Bell. We'll be doing that again at Longwood and Georgetown. Um, but in addition to that, we're looking at uh, many other possible enrichment opportunities. Uh, some members on the curriculum instruction team have been planning around uh, some STEM related uh, concepts and we're looking at how we can best uh, do that over the summer, whether we do a type of STEM camp or, uh, how we stretch that out um, and look at the different opportunities we can provide over the summer. These were just some ideas that we've been uh, looking at. We do need to recruit, obviously, staff who can also um, teach those courses and figuring out how we want to support that. We also were looking at with our Grow Your Own to see if there's some opportunities we can uh, provide teacher, um, sorry, students who've graduated from our district but plan on being teachers who maybe could do some kind of internships over the summer by being in those classes is another set of extra uh, hands in there, both for our boost classes as well as in here, um, just to provide additional support. So that's another thing that we're looking at doing um, over the summer. Um, some additional ones, uh, now these might not look as traditional because they might be a one day thing or are looking at different certifications. We're exploring these ideas. There's a lot of work um, that would go into um, these ones, but we're looking at how we can do that. As you see there, the family experience, uh, as well as we're looking at, you know, certification opportunities uh, for students at the same time. We're also looking at, um, and we're going to take suggestions from staff who might um, offer some ideas of possible enrichment ideas over the summer. I remember when I was a teacher in the district uh, a long time ago, over 20 years ago, uh, we used to get to submit, class, I think I did math magic and um, some different ones when I was a teacher, as well as teaching, uh, you know, some support classes for students as well. But we're going to be looking for ideas there. Uh, we did recently submit a grant that we're hoping to receive, and, and part of that grant was also to do an expressive arts 
um, class to support mental health over the summer. Um, and so we're hoping, um, I think we kind of like that, you know, we like the idea a lot that we're, we'll also see what we can do to make that work even if we don't get the grant, but we're looking at other opportunities that can also support uh, mental health at the same time. So um, with that, our next steps is just, uh, you know, discuss the planning with our building administration. I know that they have a lot on their plate, uh, but we're going to continue to look at how we can continue uh, supporting students over the summer. Uh, we are looking at uh, creating some summer learning coordinator uh, uh, positions and expectations, looking at a job description, posting those positions, uh, and hiring for that, something similar to our ESY coordinators, uh, ones so we can uh, do a much better job of also communicating what we have available and how people can sign up for that, as well as recruiting uh, staff members to be able to teach those courses. Uh, determine logistics of building availability. We know we're, uh, we also have uh, extended school year going on, but we do know that there's gonna be construction this summer, and so we're gonna work through that as well. I believe we have air conditioning that needs to finish at several of our buildings, and uh, we're gonna have to try to juggle that with also trying to provide services uh, for students. Um, so we, we are gonna be trying to determine those dates and locations, knowing that we have all of that um, to work with. We'll, as I said, we'll solicit additional enrichment ideas for summer learning, um, and the big task will be obviously uh, recruiting staff um, to support uh, those summer learning opportunities. So with that, I'm uh, more than happy to answer questions, um, and hopefully the, um, some of the questions that you had I've already answered, uh, but if not, feel free. What about Ms. Dumming? Um. I had, I did have a, I did send over a number of questions, so, but I'm only going to ask um, three and then um, I, I'll try and make sure that you get those again so um, you can respond to some of the other ones. But um, I wondered, we're doing the Summer Bridge program. First of all, thank you for, for the uh, concentration on, on supporting our students um, last summer because that's, that's been a big concern of mine as far as how are our students that really some that we just that didn't have the support and for resources that they needed um, how we were doing so so thank you for that um, on the summer bridge we were doing the AP summer bridge before can you tell me where we stand with that yeah we we haven't done AP summer bridge in a while and um, I I think they were finding out that uh, they were concerned about how students were going to start into AP courses at that time and they found out that, that re there really wasn't um, a large concern about how those students were performing in those classes and so um, it was a decision uh, uh, several years ago that they had stopped providing that service because they weren't seeing that same need. I think they've built in a lot in the beginning of those classes okay. for the freshmen on how um, they, what can help support them um, throughout the year um, and so but if you're hearing anything different uh, we have regular conversations making sure that we can support our students and and I think we heard from students about the need to increase our how we support students and and especially their their you know uh, mental health this uh, mental health associated with that um, algebra one um, I did have a question about that I know you you know talked about the need that sort of being like a really foundation course and I had sent a question over just and I totally understand that trying to do algebra one in the summer for those that haven't succeeded in it is, is, is yeah so the answer there is kind of it depends uh, if we had a student who was really close in um, completing that course that would be something that we would work through with like credit recovery um, you know if they finished with a 62 percent or even like a 48 percent that's real I mean that would be quite a bit more uh, work for them to do but we look at students and how close they were to see what we can support them uh, with over the summer so um, it is something we approach but it, it really depends on how close they are to um, completing that um, everything associated with that class or at least the essential things associated with that class um, versus you know if, if a student missed most of algebra one we probably would not try to make that up through credit recovery it's just such a foundational course yes. that's that's kind of when I wondered when we were doing that and then um, the last one that I'll ask when what when do we have to complete the use um, on the cares and ESSA funding how 
How much do you, do you know how much we have left? And yes. So, um, and we'll be presenting to the board about ESSER 3, oh, but okay. um, next week we'll actually uh, present to the board about um, some, some of the spending through CARES 1, but that one already ended. That was our first one uh, that went a lot towards um, nursing and supplies and um, a lot of things to, um, you know, support us right in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, CARES 2 is where we were able to really focus on th some things with summer learning, some things with class size, and we're going to be presenting on that next week. Okay. Um, and we are really trying to save um, ESSER 3 for the start of next year. Um, we're, we're working hard for that. We have another meeting this week to kind of talk and see if we can get ESSER 2 to carry us through this year. Um, and then ESSER 3, you actually have until 2024. So we're hoping... Um, you're going to see when we talk about it, we actually, we, we probably had one of the lowest per students in the state of federal funding that we received. Um, uh, a lot of that was based on, I believe, census data. And so um, you're going to see uh, when I share with you what ours was per student, it was, um, I think it was 400 and something dollars per student. When you look at, I think the average across the United States was around 2000. I'll confirm that. Um, but uh, we, we were quite low on what we received per student, but still it's great to receive that funding and we're doing a lot of great things with it. So next week we'll go into what we've done so far. Um, and then as we plan out for ESSER 3, that's, we'll bring that to the board. We actually, I believe by law, have to have a hearing uh, connected to that one and demonstrate, um, you know, how we're doing that and that's right, we have um, the different components with that. So we, we do plan on doing that. Um, we're trying to make sure that we kind of empty out uh, CARES 1 and ESSER 2 uh, before we roll into ESSER 3. Thank you. So yeah, that you're, you'll be giving a presentation on December 6th at our December 6th yes. meeting on yes. the federal spending and programs that we got. Yes. We won't get a lot into ESSER 3 completely at that time, but we'll talk about what we've used some funds so far for. Um, uh, we won't go into summer learning because uh, uh, we just kind of did a little bit about that, but we'll go into the other things that we've done so far with it. Okay. Ms. Grover. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, especially the younger kids, elementary, the video just showed their enthusiasm. and. I know this past summer they were very excited because as part of their summer program, elementary school got a bunch of books, um, reading books. Um, would we be able to do that again this we, summer? We want to. We heard great. We received great feedback about that. So last year, um, what she was referring to is our our K through. Um, actually, I think we started with early childhood through fourth grade. Um, we provided. Uh, at our title schools, 10 books um, per students. To uh, the students could keep over the summer and five books for the rest of our students. There was a large cost to that. So that is something that we um, received great feedback with. And I do think it helped quite a bit to keep our students reading over the summer. So that is something that we are um, considering again um, to see how we can support that. I, I think we spent around 250000 on that that we did out of ESSER funding as well. Um, and so we are looking at um, how we can uh, support students that way. Getting books in hands is, is critical. Yeah, it was great. It was a great program. Yes. And um, we did that for all kids, not yeah, um, ones who just no, signed up. So. No, I know, I know. And I, I was bummed out because my kid was a sixth grader. <laughs> <laughs> we um, did. And the kids were so excited to get those books, to bring them home and to put them in their backpacks. So yeah. it, um, it, was, it, it was great. And we heard a lot of positive feedback about it. Yeah. I think we were all as excited to make sure that they had those books as the kids were to receive them. Yeah, and our schools were great. We were trying to get them, um, we were trying to give them some notice ahead of time about what the titles of those books were because a lot of people were doing book fairs at the end of the year and so we didn't, um, we were, you know, we were, we were trying to get out in front of that uh, so that kids weren't buying uh, certain books and then they were getting them from us at the same time. So, and that is one of those hard things to try to um, schedule out. We're, we're fortunate uh, to, to work with um, some companies who, get, who really help us in trying to make that happen. Great. Um, my other question is on slide 12. It's um, the online summer learning. Yes. And I know a lot of high school students like that because a lot of those courses are required courses um, that they need to take to graduate. Are there, are we planning, maybe not next year, but in future years, adding 
other courses that are graduate requirements? We continue to have conversations about that. There's a lot that goes into building those courses and you know, I'm trying to make them effective, but we're constantly trying to see um, what would be possible. Um, uh, you know, we've had a lot of changes over the last couple years and so um, our time right now hasn't been focused on increasing those yet, but I think that could be something that we explore in the future. Um, especially if we're not going to be working with COD and if there's opportunities to increase some options there. Great, thank you. That's, that's it. Ms. Fosdick. Thank you for what you presented. It is exciting to me to see kids excited about learning even in the summer. Um, what I'm asked about is something I asked about a little bit earlier and you did touch on briefly, you know, potentially having an expressive arts program or some mental health piece. Um, and I'm wondering as part of this summer learning or summer program of taking care of our kids, if we would, if we have ever considered doing some kind of like summer connections or touch point, especially for um, kids moving from middle school to high school. Uh, just as a way, a workshop or check-in or strategies, you know, uh, we're seeing and we know that learning about taking care of ourselves and our mental health is just as important as our academic learning. Yeah, um, I think it's a, a, a great point. I don't know if there's a course or how we connect with them or, or what we do to continue that. And, I, and that is something I will definitely bring up with um, our um, social emotional learning and wellness coordinator. Um, especially now, I mean, we're having a lot of conversations. We just recently, as I said, applied for a grant. We rolled in that expressive arts, but it's actually a grant being provided by the state. Uh, it would be 250,000 a year for two years, so a total of 500,000. Uh, we are looking at parent education. It's all related to social emotional learning, mental health and wellness. And so we're looking at parent education, additional student uh, services, um, additional speakers that uh, we could do at buildings, but also what are some other things we can do to support mental health across the district. Um, in a district our size, um, 250,000 doesn't go a long way, but it's, it, I mean, any little bit helps on what we can do to support all students. Um, we, there's also some things with, um, you know, uh, teen mental health training and uh, mental health first aid training and stuff, you do need a certain percentage of your staff to be trained first uh, before you can start offering to uh, students with that. And so we, uh, we have been, we do have trainers in our own district now um, and we continue to uh, offer those trainings um, and people continue to sign up for them. And we're looking at, are there opportunities where we can kind of pick up the pace on that? Um, but it's, that's the hard part, finding time. And so we are looking at that and what other ones. I do like your suggestion and we'll uh, share that with the team as well. Thank you. Uh, my last point is, it's just a question, um, especially as, as you're presenting tonight, mentioned, you know, we all know how it feels to get behind um, and how scary that can feel and how stressful and how much weight that is. Um, how, what do we do to communicate these options to our kids for like credit recovery so that they know, right? We wanna of course encourage them to do what they can during the school year to stay on top of things. Right. I think there's, a, well, a lot of that we do depend on, um, you know, our teachers, our counselors, um, uh, you know, our deans, our administrators looking at how students are performing. They do talk and discuss about how students are doing, um, how they're progressing in a class. Um, I know they do have a lot of conversations about um, especially uh, trying to identify students who might not be on track and uh, providing those options. I think they also try to provide those options to parents of those students. Um, and we'll continue um, those efforts. We are offering credit recovery throughout the year as well. Um, that was something we started to do last year. Um, so because, like you said, you, it, those can snowball really quickly. And so if we can take care of some of those, but one of the challenges with that is, you know, if you have a student who's been struggling with a full load and then you try to add something else for them to do on top of that. So um, there is a balancing act to that. And I mean, we have great staff in our buildings who do try to be delicate about that and how they can support the students while not trying to overwhelm them. 
Um, that is one of the hardest parts um, is, you know, the full load plus let's do this on top of that. And many students, um, you know, might be in a fragile state and that's why they're, um, you know, not on track. And so it, it is a, a definitely a balancing act. Well, I appreciate your work to make sure we're addressing that side of our kids learning as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Karubas. Oh, Mr. Deming. I mean, sorry. God, I'm losing my mind. Rising. I'm like dumbing. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's been a long Sleepy day. Sleepy time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you can look at slide 16, um, which is kind of the focus of 2022, I know you said at the beginning, and, and we knew this because we talked about this last year, that one of the biggest struggles for this past summer was staffing. Um, staff was burnt out, uh, but the numbers we got were respectable. Uh, but my concern is leading into the summer, um, I think we all want to expand this, um, you know, the, the, the academic boost at the elementary and the middle school um, but I guess my concern was you said the summer bridge wasn't as well attended as maybe the credit recovery. And while credit recovery is extremely important for our students to graduate, um, you know, I think we all continue to hear what are we doing to help those high school students um, with the learning loss that they experienced. Um, so assuming <laughs> in a perfect world we could get as much staffing as we needed i mean could we is this something we could you know because i'm just looking at the numbers of high school 132 for summer bridge and 182 for credit recovery i mean that's 314 high school students and i'm sure and i guess my question is especially regarding that summer bridge were the students identified or was it offered? Because I'm sure we would have more take advantage of it if it was something that was offered. We kind of have rolling offers with that. We had a lot of students who did not um, take us up on that and that happens every summer. I wouldn't say we were, um, obviously we would like more students to take advantage of that. We were not short on staff for the summer bridge program. Um, that's been something that has uh, uh, been in place the last couple of years and they look forward to the, those opportunities and building those relationships at that time. Um, uh, we do often offer, 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 and either, I mean, people, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the summer. Yeah. And um, I, I think especially last summer, some people chose to, um, you know, uh, take a step away from um, school and took it every advantage they could over the summer to um, do family events or, or, or different things like that. But we'll continue to emphasize, um, you know, how important that is. We look at all different uh, type of needs with, with that. Um, we have, uh, you know, parents reach out to us and ask, you know, I really think my child need this and we direct them right away to find a way to give them the opportunity to do that. Um, there's a lot of students we're reaching out to saying this would be great. They work very closely with our middle schools on which kids are going to most benefit from this. And then they continue to try to provide that um, and try to increase the number. Um, every time a student says no, I think they open it up to another student to try to see if um, they want to take advantage of that opportunity. Well, and it's encouraging that our staff at all levels is trying to identify the kids that really need the help. Yeah. Um, but I hope we continue to try to maximize this as much as possible for future years um, with the money that we have. But again, it's a fine balancing act because you can only do so much with the staffing that you have as well. So yeah. I, I understand that. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, just, oh, two more comments, just not questions, comments. Summer learning couldn't, stress how great it is uh, enough I, both my daughters did it it was wonderful especially for those kids that are in you know band or music or art that 
you know, can't take some of those core classes that they need to get for graduation, they're, the online course is, is great for the high school students. And then, um, not that I'm telling administration how to do their job and operate the district, but I would highly suggest you put out the posting for the summer jobs, like right after winter break when the teachers are all rested and everything, <laughs> instead of right before winter break. But thank you, John. Doug. Yeah, we will. We're, we're working on our timing for that. We do think some of the enrichment offerings, too, that we'll have um, excitement. On. I mean, I, I couldn't be more grateful for our teachers who did. Um, it, you know, it's it has been difficult uh, and exhausting, and a lot of new things learned last year in in how to instruct students. And the fact that we had as many teachers as we did to come back and um, spend their summers, um, you know, uh, supporting students, and and they want what's best for kids. And I I I. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens ag again um, with how many teachers are dedicated support. I mean, you saw the smile on the teachers' faces uh, even in the 21st century one and the opportunities that were given to kids. We're looking at, can we replicate that in some of our enrichment opportunities as well for students? Ms. Jane. Thank you. Um, I remember towards the end of the year, there was a little bit of um, I don't know, uncertainty or anxiousness about how these programs would be and where the students would be and how much the teachers could give after last year. And it's really encouraging. And credit goes to you and all the teachers for the enthusiasm they bring into these programs. Um, I'm just curious if we did any sort of pre or post assessment on some of the programs that we offer just to see uh, how effective our programs were since we are hoping to do this long term or at least next summer? We didn't do any, uh, we didn't, honestly, we didn't want to spend the time uh, in the summer assessing students. We had them for 12 days. Um, so we were really focused on building relationships, uh, progressing. We already had an idea of where the students were kind of performing um, as uh, students were recommended. Um, for the opportunities. I, I did hear from several parents who were so excited um, when their child um, was uh, recommended and had that opportunity because they wanted those supports as well. Uh, we are um, still monitoring those students right now as we get data in to see um, how they're progressing or what supports do we need. I, I'm, I just happened to regularly talk to two parents who had um, students in the course and uh, they continue to tell me how much they're really young. Um, I think one's a second grader and one has a first grader and how they're progressing um, with, their, um, with their academic skills uh, so far into this school year. And are, we're grateful both for the summer, the books that went home, uh, but also for those summer opportunities. And so um, obviously we hope we can expand that for other students, but we are trying to track how those students are doing um, and we'll continue to do so. Great. Um. The other thing that I was wondering, so for the 21st century grant, were these teacher recommended students that joined the program? Or no. how were they selected? Open to all students, uh, the okay. 21st century grant. So, um, and it was our first year, so um, we do think this summer we'll have even more um, kids who take part in that. Um, and uh, actually, our, the, what we were offering be with Beyond the Bell prior to that, right after we got the grant and after school, most of those were um, online through Zoom. And so um, we still had a lot of nervousness next last summer for people to come in person and we were doing the camp invention in person. So that was, um, we do think that that um, impacted the numbers a little mm -hmm. bit as well as just vacations and different things going on. I think people are now planning for that for next summer, but we offered it to all kids um, at Longwood and Georgetown. There was, it was not That's broken great. down by any other thing except to offer that. We're doing that throughout the year. For the grant, we need to have a minimum number um, as well um, so that we can keep getting our funding at a certain level, so. Yeah, that's really great to hear because I, I kind of have the same concerns as what Board Member Rising explained in the sense that I know our teachers are doing such a great job trying to identify those students, but there are those certain students that might fall through the crack or may not have right. been noticed or may need help with this. and. If we can get those students to also partake, that would that would be wonderful. And that's you know um, that's our teachers get to know our students and families so well. So I know there's also a lot of 
um, encouraging and calls and saying, please sign up for this. I know a lot of that happened. Also, uh, Dr. Tara Bell, she did a lot of um, reaching out. We also, um, we had a retired um, teacher slash administrator who um, also um, uh, speaks fluent Spanish, who was calling a lot of families as well, trying to encourage them and give them as much information um, um, as well to try to get as many students to come in um, and be a part of it as possible. So. I'll, I'll just add that there are so uh, many teachers from across the district who were participating in the program. A physics teacher from NICLA participates and teaches in that program. Um, uh, retired teachers, uh, just a whole array, and not just teachers from Longwood and Georgetown. Great, that's really great. And I just have one last kind of comment or um, just to echo what board member uh, Fostick mentioned, I, I would love to see a summer program that's not so much academic oriented, but more based on life skills, uh, which could be tied in with our career readiness, or but also implement uh, the social emotional learning skills that I'll give students time to deal with scenarios and life stressors and perhaps strategies on how to cope with these life stressors. It's so hard to fit in um, throughout the academic year, and I know this district is really trying hard to do that, but if we could be more proactive rather than reactive, um, which I know we're not just reactive, but um, if such programs could be made available over the summer, um, I think that would be great to see. I, I think that's a great idea. I do think that's, um, and I think it would fall right under there, but I think that is something that we'd have to look at the federal funding to possibly support and do something like that as tuition free. I think, um, you know, I will have conversations around that. I think it's a great idea. Or what are some different opportunities we can do? Maybe it's not, you know, two weeks straight, but it's, you know, um, some different opportunities where for check-ins or those types of things. It makes complete sense. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, that Camp Invention is a very cool program. And it, it kind of, I mean, it's not a social emotional thing, but it's not like a class where you're taking, you know, um, it's creative, right? It's, it's coming up with concepts and ideas of how to solve different puzzles or things that they have to, to work with. and. I really, I think that's a great value. I love the involvement of the grow your own um, possibility that you brought up. Um, I think that would be a wonderful way of um, further engaging students that are interested in, in teaching. And um, I do um, sometimes wonder, like, you know, we did hear a lot from the students today from Niqua, and Sometimes I, you know, summer sometimes needs to be a break for students. Right. And I worry sometimes that some of the enrollment in the summer learning is to get something out of the way so that they can take something that puts additional pressure on the students. And um, I guess I would just encourage families to look closely at, you know, what they're doing and, and making sure that students are given a break when, you know, when when they need it especially during the summer months it's one of the reasons we are looking at like even maybe we can do some one day things and make it more family engagement type of things as well but trying to do that so it's not too much uh, additional on top either right all right thank you very much thank you so our um, next items on the agenda is legislative advocacy and the board of education update and i believe miss grover you have something on the right so um this saturday friday it starts friday this weekend is the iasb um meeting and as saturday we will be meeting at the delegate assembly to discuss the resolutions last board meeting we voted on the resolutions and today um, I had given everybody uh, what our vote was and today it's um, whether you guys want me to speak on anything. Um, the way the delegate assembly is going to work this year is different in that um, Mr. Rising we're not going to have paddles anymore. It's going to be um, technology now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we vote 
uh, with our internet connections are going to be working, they said, and so we will be using our phones to vote. Um, so I, I plan to, unless um, I'm hoping that the belief statement that IPSD submitted will be on the consent agenda item. If it's not, I'm, then I do prepare to speak on that one. But if there's any other one that you guys would like me to speak on, let me know. Anything, anybody? Okay. I, I was thinking since we had a split votes on pretty much everything that it probably would be just most appropriate to just speak on your belief statement if, if that one comes up. Okay. Yeah, my guess is on the ones that get pulled from the consent agenda, you might write something up and never get a chance up there to, to speak because the line just gets huge. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but kind of like Lori said, we, you know, we're split on quite a few votes, and those other ones that we weren't split on, they'll get enough opposition. Right. Okay. Yes. I, if you were going to speak on any, based on what our board also said here, I would, I would ask that you consider speaking about the child safe gun storage. Okay. Even though I wasn't before. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone have any other items in this area? I'll just um, make sure the public knows that this weekend is our conference, the State Conference of School Boards for Illinois. And so the board will be in training on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, um, attending different sessions to learn how to be an even better school board member than you already are. So thank you all for your dedication and um, happy uh, board member uh, day. So thank you. And our board is presenting. At the oh, that's true too. too. Yes, we we will have a presentation on uh, Saturday at two o'clock on TIFFs and uh, Mr. Rising and Mr. Karubas will be presenting along with Mr. Shipley and uh, our attorney. So thank you very much. It'll be a, a very worthwhile session for people. So with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Peter, you made it through.